Hi, my name's Morgan, and this is a video on Curious Carpet Cutting Cats, brought to you by 3 Blue One Brown's Summer of Maths Exposition Contest. It's a simple puzzle that just so happens to stumble into one of the most important proofs in math history. So, imagine you're a carpet salesman, that's you, and one day, an eccentric interior designer friend comes into your store with a bizarre request. She needs a stretch of carpet that's exactly twice as long as it is wide, but that at any moment, on a whim, can be cut up and rearranged into a square carpet of the same area. It doesn't seem too difficult. The problem is, for whatever reason, she needs all the edges of these carpets to be perfect integers. You knew there was a reason that you stopped inviting her over. Now mathematically, what you're looking for is two integers where doubling the square of one equals the square of the other. There's a few ways to go about this, maybe geometrically. You could draw up some squares and rectangles, measure them, cut them up and see if any of them work. Or maybe graphically, you could plot some polynomials, look at the charts, and see if any of the intersection points happen to match the grid lines. But if you want a really simple place to start, maybe you should just try plugging some numbers in. Consecutive numbers are a good place to start. You try one and two, two and three, three and four, and it seems like these numbers are almost what we're looking for. But then as you start going higher, the gaps seem to shrink relative to the numbers themselves. And unfortunately, this pattern continues. By the time you get to double digits, the gaps aren't growing nearly as fast as the numbers themselves are. So it's pretty easy to prove to yourself that there's no consecutive numbers where this holds. So maybe try a different approach. Pick one number m and one number n, and increment those numbers until they outgrow one another. So in this case, when you increment n, n squared gets too big, so you punch m up to compensate. And by following this kind of back and forth method, you get pairs of numbers which feel arbitrarily close, like 7 and 10, which give you 98 and 100. That's so close. Ridiculously close. And there's so many pairs of these if you keep going. Pairs that are just one or two apart from each other. Like the maths is taunting you for not being able to find the perfect pair of numbers. And understandably, continuing with this approach might get a little bit frustrating. Something that might help us out is the prime factorization of our numbers. Every number has a unique set of prime numbers that you can divide it up into, like the building blocks of that number. So 12 becomes 2 squared times 3, 63 becomes 3 squared times 7, and 210 becomes 2 by 3 by 5 by 7. So let's just take a look at some square numbers, and see if we can work out if there's any kind of pattern that will help us going forwards. It's pretty easy to spot after a while that all of the exponents in your prime factorization will be even numbers. And this makes sense, as per exponent laws, when you take a set of numbers multiplied together and raise them to a power, that power multiplies all of the powers that those numbers were risen to. And the same works in reverse. If you have a number where all of the exponents are even numbers, when you take the square root of that number, you will be left with a whole integer, meaning that that number is a square number by definition. With this new fact under our belt, let's take another look at our elusive formula from earlier. Subbing in the prime factors of m, in general since we don't know what m is, and noting that a, b, and c could be equal to zero, which would remove that prime from the equation, we can bring in the exponent from the outside so that now all of our prime factors are to even powers. Now some eagle-eyed exponent experts might already notice the contradiction here. Specifically, that if we bring the 2 in from outside the parentheses, we now have a factor of 2 which is to an odd power, 2a plus 1. Effectively what this means is that the number on the right cannot possibly be a square number, as we established before. There are no two integers which fulfill the equation n squared equals 2m squared. For the puzzle this means that there is no carpet that can fulfill your friend's requests. But if we turn the handle a little bit, we can get something more out of this. By moving the m squared over to the left, and then square rooting both sides, we can conclude that there is no rational representation of the square root of 2. And this just blew me away when I first came across it, because it's like we accidentally stumbled into one of the most important proofs in mathematics. Now personally I prefer this proof to your traditional square root of 2 proof, just because it feels like the stepping stones are easier to follow, and even better, it can be generalized upwards. So if the two-factor carpet is impossible, what about a carpet that's three times as long as it is wide? Could you cut that one up and turn it into a square? Luckily we can pretty much use the same logic as last time. n squared equals 3m squared, and then by bringing the exponent in and multiplying it by 3, we get a factor of 3 which is to an odd power, straight away. 
So just like before, it's impossible for the number on the right to be a square number. And then we can do the same mathematical shuffling as earlier to show that there is no rational representation of the square root of 3. It's pretty easy to prove this for any prime number, really. The maths always works out the same. So, let's set n squared to be a prime number times m squared. When you expand m squared out and multiply it by that prime number, that prime factor is automatically to an odd power, meaning that p times m squared cannot be a square number, and that there is no rational root to that prime number, or any prime number for that matter. But what about composite numbers? Well, if we break a composite number down into its prime factors, we can do the same. So, I'm going to use 12 as an example. And 12 breaks down to 2 squared times 3. 2 squared times 3 times n squared. Could this be a square number? Well, if we expand both of them out and then multiply, you can see that even though 2 has wound up to an even power, 3 was not so lucky. And so 12 befalls the same fate as all the numbers we tested before it, in that it is an incompatible number with our carpet problems. And as such, there is no rational root for 12. And so, you tell your interior design friend, there is no factor x to which she will be able to stretch a carpet and have it be rearrangeable into a square, so long as x has a single factor risen to an odd power. Since when you multiply that number by a square number, it is impossible to get a result which does not have one factor to an odd power, meaning that it can't be a square number. It also means that there is not a single rational root for any composite number with any factor risen to an odd power. So what about numbers where all of the factors are risen to even powers? Well, as we discussed earlier, these numbers must be square numbers with integer roots. It's the very way that we defined them. And this means that if you were to take one square number, like 36, and multiply it by another square number, all of the factors in your result would be to even powers. And this means that there is a perfectly rational root to 36, and that 36 solves our carpet problem. So you go back to your interior designer friend, and you tell her it's only possible to cut a carpet up and turn it into a square if it's a square number times longer than it is wide. Okay, now she's asking for a solid prism of carpet, rectangular, an m by m on its short side, and any number by m on its long side, that she can cut up and turn into a cube of carpet. At this point you suspect she's starting to mess with you a little bit. But hey, you're an expert at this now, so you bring back the cubic version of the formula from earlier. Prime factorization time, it turns out all cubed numbers have their factors risen to multiples of 3. So, if you take a non-cubed number and multiply it by a cubed number, you're going to wind up with factors which are not risen to multiples of 3, meaning that the result cannot be a cubed number. And this brings with it all of the same non-rational root implications as before. On the other hand, if you pick a cubic number to multiply it by, in your result, all of the factors are going to be to multiples of 3, meaning there is a rational root and it solves the carpet problem. And so you generalize and say that x solves the carpet problem and will have a rational root so long as x is a cubic number. And the same is true for fourth powers and for fifth powers. In fact, this generalizes no matter how high you want it to go. The proof isn't exactly pretty, but let's take a look at it. So, assume that x here is not a power of gamma, meaning that y and z will not be multiples of gamma. When you multiply those in, 2 and 3 are no longer to the power of multiples of gamma, so x does not fulfill this equation. But if we go back and assume that x is a power of gamma, then 2 and 3 will be risen to multiples of gamma, and so when you multiply them in, nothing's a problem. Everything is a multiple of gamma, meaning that x solves the equation. I really hope I've made it clear what I'm trying to get across here, that x will only have a rational root if it is a perfect power of the number you are rooting it by. So unfortunately, you need to go to your interior designer friend and give them the sad, sad news that their dreams of higher dimensional carpets are pretty limited. I think it should be no secret by now that the carpet aspect of this puzzle was just kind of a superfluous stepping stone to get to the real meat of this proof, which is that any integer k, when you take its nth root, is either an integer or completely irrational, and no in-between, and that specifically, if your number k isn't a perfect power of n, then its root is irrational. 
What I love about this proof is that it's simple enough for an amateur mathematician like me with no real experience with mathematical writing can understand it, but also that it's completely general, whereas in the past the only accessible proofs I've found for this kind of thing have only ever been for one or two cases at a time. 